Good evening, folks. Welcome to Lesson 52 in the Gospel of Luke. I'd like to start this evening by reading Psalm 107, because it has some elements in it that tie into what we're going to be discussing this evening. Psalm 107, which reads, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons. For they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to the children of man. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities, they suffered affliction, and they loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to the children of man, and let them offer sacrifices with thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of joy. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord as wondrous works in the deep, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. He turns desert into pools of water and parched land into springs of water, and there he lets the hungry dwell, and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing, they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminish. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. We are going to be in Luke chapter 15 this evening, looking at three parables, which are fairly familiar text to us, but we have been so far a year in the gospel of Luke. And uh, just some interesting trivia of what we have covered so far in this uh, long journey that we've had. I'm thinking we have less than a year left, uh, but that depends on, because we're speeding up here. We we're hitting Luke, all of Luke 15 tonight, all of Luke 16 next week. But then we're gonna slow down dramatically when Jesus hits Jerusalem and, the, and look at the events that are going to be taking place there. Uh, we're about 65% of the way through the book, if you want. Math. Math isn't really my strong suit, but 
I can give you a quick Reader's Digest version of what we've looked at so far today. Chapter one of Luke, we have the prophecy of John the Baptist birth. We have the prophecy of Jesus birth. And then John the Baptist is born, named by his father, Zechariah. And then Zechariah gives that long prophecy about what John is going to do in making a people ready for the coming of the Lord in the person of Jesus. Chapter two, all about the birth of Jesus, his presentation in the temple to Simeon, and Simeon giving that prophecy about what the coming of Jesus portended for Israel and the division that he was going to bring. That's one of the central points that we've seen through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and then the early, the childhood of Jesus and his parents losing him in Jerusalem, traveling a day away and not knowing they left their child behind and finding him after three days of searching as he's sitting in the temple and, and speaking with the religious teachers there. Chapter three, ministry of John the Baptist, baptism of Jesus at the end of it. John who says, who warned you to the people coming out to him, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? John sees the, the coming of Jesus as something that's going to stir things up. And there is going to be wrath because Jesus is bringing division. Some are going to choose Jesus. Some are going to reject Jesus. On um, those who reject him, wrath is going to fall ultimately. Chapter four, we have the temptation of Jesus and his first sermon that Luke records for us, which takes place in his hometown of Nazareth. And the people who knew him as he was growing up as a young man don't really react very well to his message. They take him outside the village to a cliff and they are about to throw him over the edge, but Jesus eludes their grasp and leaves and goes on to Capernaum, where in chapter five, he chooses his first disciples, Peter and James, John, Andrew, the ones there who are fishing. And then later on in chapter five, Levi, who's sitting at his tax booth, and Jesus says to him, follow me. And Levi gets up, leaves everything, follows Jesus, and then hosts an enormous party for Jesus, inviting other tax collectors in. And this is the first encounter we have with the Pharisees, who ask the disciples, what are you doing? Why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus begins to give us the insight into his ministry that he already outlined in chapter four when he quoted from Isaiah 62, saying that this is the year of the favor of the Lord. He sent me to preach good news to the poor, to the blind, to the oppressed, to bring healing to them, to bring deliverance and rescue. And Jesus tells the Pharisees that the well don't need a physician. It's the sick who need a doctor. I've come to reach to teach and save those who are lost. I've come to seek and save those who are lost. Chapter six, we have the Sermon on the Plain, which is very similar to Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount, only much shorter than what Matthew gives us. And we find great crowds made up of three components. We have the apostles, which he has chosen at the start of chapter six. We have the disciples, which is the larger crowd. And then the big crowd that's following after Jesus because Jesus is the new odd thing to come along and, and they're curious as to what he has to say. Chapter seven, uh, John the Baptist sends disciples to Jesus asking, are you the one who is to come or should we be looking for somebody else? Jesus tells them what to report and they go back to John and, and he turns to the crowd and says and addresses them about John saying that John was a great man, but whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. And hearing this, the tax collectors rejoice and they declare God just because they had received John's baptism. The Pharisees who rejected God's purpose turn their back on it and say, this is nonsense. This, this is, you're, you're talking crazy talk. From there, the scene shifts to the house of Simon the Pharisee, where Jesus is having dinner with him, and in comes this sinful woman, standing behind Jesus, weeping, just overcome at being in the presence of the one who is offering forgiveness. And she washes his feet with her tears and wipes his feet with her hair and breaks open that alabaster jar of ointment, that expensive perfume, and anoints Jesus' feet 
and Simon sitting there scratching his head thinking, if this man was a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him because she's a sinner. And Jesus gives to him the parable about the debtors, the one who owes a whole lot of money, the one who doesn't owe a whole lot of money, and asks Simon the telling question, who's going to love more? I'll let you read the rest of that. Chapter 8, parable of the sower and the, the four different types of soil. After Jesus explains that, there's the stilling of the storm as they're sailing in the boat and they come to the region of the Gerasenes where they run into the Gerasene demoniac who says he is possessed of a legion of demons. And there's that whole encounter there where Jesus expels the demons from the man into the herd of pigs. The pigs destroy themselves. The people of the town come and see Jesus and they're terrified. And they beg Jesus to leave, go away. They're frightened by what his coming means. The man, the poor man from whom all the demons have come out, he wants to go with Jesus. And Jesus says, no, you go and you tell everybody. You tell everyone you meet what God has done for you. And he does just that. The first true missionary for Jesus, going and just spreading the news about Jesus to the Gentiles and stirring them up and getting them interested Chapter 9, uh, we have the confession of Peter that you are the Christ of God, followed by Jesus' first explanation of what his ministry entails, that he's going to go to a cross, that he's going to die, that he's going to be buried, that he's going to be raised, moves on from there to the Mount of Transfiguration, where Peter, Andrew, and, and uh, Peter, James, and John rather see Jesus glorified on top of the mountain. Chapter 10 parable of the Good Samaritan and the questioning of the, the law expert who wants to justify himself asking, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus explains, not who is your neighbor, but to whom are you a neighbor? To whom do you prove yourself to be a neighbor? It's not a matter of uh, is Gail my neighbor and it, is Tia my neighbor? Uh, okay, I'll accept those two, but um, the Birchers, no, 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 I'm not so sure about them. Rather, it's to whom am I showing myself to be a neighbor? If I'm showing myself to be a neighbor to all of them and seeking to minister to them, then I've answered the question of exactly who is my neighbor. Chapter 11, Pharisees accuse Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Satan. And Jesus talks about a house divided can't stand. If Satan is divided against Satan, then he's going to tear himself apart. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And from that point, things start to really escalate with what Jesus is teaching and explaining to his disciples. In chapter 12, he speaks about how he has come to bring division, that the, the house, the people are going to be divided even down to the, the family units. Some are going to be for Jesus in the family. Some are going to be against Jesus in the family. And Jesus is going, that, that's going to divide people from one another. Chapters 13 and 14 really parallel each other in that we each have a healing on a Sabbath day and a lot of discussion ensues because of it. But chapter 13's point, the main point is in the first six verses where Jesus says, repent or perish. And then what we looked at last week in chapter 14, the idea of counting the cost um, and making sure you are fully committed that you're going to stay the course. Uh, and then what we're looking at tonight, the parable of the prodigal son, which is a very familiar text to everyone, I should think. So last week, we looked at the counting of the cost where Jesus extends the invitation. We're told this is after leaving a, the, the last dinner that he has with the Pharisee in the Gospel of Luke, that many, the, the crowd was just coming. Many were coming to Jesus. And he turns to them and says, if you're going to follow me, then here's what, it's, here's what it could cost you. 
here's what it may cost you. It could be at the expense of your family relationships. If you, a oh wife, are a believer and a disciple in Christ, but your husband wants nothing to do with Jesus, and in fact demands that you stop worshiping him, that causes you have a choice. Are you going to stay with your husband? Or are you going to follow your Lord? Hopefully you can do both in an agreeable situation. But in the end, Jesus says, you need to make a determination. Where is your loyalty going to be? Is it going to be with Jesus? Or is it going to be with husband, wife, son, daughter, mother, father, whomever? Uh, come carrying your own cross. Be ready to give up your life. Be ready to bear whatever shame comes your way as Jesus bore shame on our behalf. Uh, Jesus has been calling us to do anything that he hasn't already done. Come leaving everything else behind because there is nothing more important than the relationship that we have with God through Christ. But come counting the cost. Make sure that you're willing to, once you start this journey, that you're willing to finish the course instead of being the one who lays the foundation of the tower and then you're unable to complete it, you're unable to build and, and you suffer greater than mockery. And in the idea of finishing the course that Jesus shares through, if salt somehow loses its, its savor, it's, if it somehow loses its flavor, it's not good for anything, it gets thrown out. In the same way, if I stop being a disciple, if I stop showing myself to be uh, a child of God, then what use am I? The gifts that I've given me come to no value. I, I am of no value. And God says, out you go into the, into the dung heap. So I'm going to read for you chapter 15 of Luke. Uh, 40 minutes to go. Hmm. There'll be 40 fast minutes. Luke chapter 15, familiar text, as I said. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, I, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, Give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And, he, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, 
bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now with his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Some really, really powerful stuff here that uh, I'm going to try to go through slowly, but quickly enough that we can get through all of it. Chapter 14 ends with the statement, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, who comes to hear? Tax collectors and sinners. Come near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees start to gripe about it. So Jesus gives these three parables that look in that are in response to the complaints, in response to what the, the Pharisees are saying. And they have this the common theme of extreme joy over the recovery of what was lost. The parables justify his association with sinners. They invite the Pharisees to rejoice with Jesus at the repentance of the tax collectors and give insight into the father's own disposition or his, his attitude regarding sinners. God doesn't hate sinners. God, uh, God loves the sin, sinner and wants the sinner to repent. Uh, Christy writes, I get the gold star. All the par parables have a lost item in common. Yes, they do. And she saw that before I got to my notes about it. But they have other things in common as well. There's uh, themes running through. There's the need for repentance. And all of those that's expressed in all three of them in the, the sinner who repents more than the 99 persons uh, who need no repentance. And in verse 10, there is joy before the angels of heaven over the sinner who repents. The idea of the, the necessity for repentance as a precursor to the joy that is going to follow is emphasized. There's the finding of what is lost and the effort that it, that's expended in that many uh, many, many verses here. And then finally, God's joy. And it's it, obviously God is, is the one rejoicing uh, over the thing found in all of these uh, parables. Um, there's God's joy at the recovery of what was lost. And, and they bear witness to God's indomitable love for us and his joy over repentance and the lengths to which God is willing to go for the recovery of my soul. It reminds me of this line from uh, the song, Reckless Love, that, and that starts the chorus, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And I think that's apropos here. Some people object to that song and the word reckless in it. I think it's really fitting because all three of these parables highlight actions that taken from the viewpoint of wisdom and practicality might be called into question as not wise. These aren't parables about prudence or about wisdom, but rather about the recovery of what was lost and God's singular joy over the repentance of that one sinner, the length that God is willing to go in order to recover that one soul and, and to bring that sinner back into the fold into into the kingdom into where uh, he can 
to be saved and be with God forever and eternity. So all three of the parables are given an answer to the grumbling. And it's really interesting. And we have to interpret the all three of them, including the prodigal son, in light of that grumbling. The Pharisees object to Jesus sitting down with the tax collectors and associating with them and receiving them and welcoming them and eating with them. So the first two sort of set up the idea that rejoicing over the recovery of what is lost is the appropriate response. And then in true fashion to Jesus' teaching, he turns that on its head with the parable of the prodigal son by underscoring the reaction of the older brother. Uh, 20% of the parable of the prodigal son is about the son's actions. The rest of the parable is about the father and his actions and his discourse with the older son. Uh, so Jesus is, is trying to make a point here, and I think it comes clear as we, as we draw closer to that. So sinners draw near to hear Jesus in verse 1. In verse 2, the, the, Pharisees, <laughs> the Pharisees have an issue with this. Jesus is extending welcome to these reprobates, these sinners. This man receives sinners. Not only does he receive them, he eats with them. Can you imagine that? And if you remember when we looked at Pharisees early on in chapter 7, that when Jesus came and had the first dinner with a Pharisee, the first meal, Pharisees were very, very picky about who they invited to their meal. As a spoiler, the older son's complaint is, you never gave me a goat so I could have a meal with my friends. That sounds like a fairly exclusive group, a group that does not include his younger brother by any means, may not even include the father. Um, a very specific group of individuals that he wants to eat with. Jesus is called a friend of tax collectors in Luke chapter 7, verse 34. We've already seen that. Uh, and I mentioned earlier when we were doing the real quick run through of where we've been and how we got to where we are, the question that is asked of Jesus' disciples, why on earth do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? Tax collectors are a despised group within Judaism. And yet Luke consistently portrays them as receptive to the words of Jesus. And the broad term sinner. Sinner could be anyone from someone who is a, a very determined lawbreaker to someone who does not practice religion or does not do their religious observance the way the Pharisees or those judging them think they should. If, for example, uh, when I take communion, for some reason, I hold my right arm up in the air and say, praise God. And someone looks at me and says, what's your, what's your scriptural authority for that? And then I say, well, I have none. They say, well, you're a sinner because you're observing communion differently than I do. All right, where's your scriptural authority for that? And we, we can argue about that later. But the idea is the Pharisees are scrutinizing the people in order to find fault. Jesus is looking at the heart of the individual in order to draw them near. Which of them is right? Which of them are you more glad as your savior? I'll take Jesus, thank you. Because I am never so unclean as to be unwelcomed by Jesus or unwanted by him. So he gives us this parable about the man who has a hundred sheep. A hundred sheep is a really large flock of sheep. And some people raise objection. Well, why on earth would the man leave 99 sheep sitting on, a, in, on the hill by, hill by themselves? They are um, not by themselves. No man's going to watch a hundred sheep on his own. He's going to have assistance. But that's not pertinent to the parable. In fact, none of these objections here of practicality in the Judean wilderness the odds of finding it alive are really slim. There are animals around there that eat sheep. Sheep are not known for uh, their, um, their woodcraft or their camping savvy. They can't make lean-tos, they can't start fires, they can't even open up a can of beans to eat. Sheep are 
pretty much helpless if they're off on their own. They, they need to be with other members of the flock. He might lose more sheep if he goes after this one than the than than the one that's straight. And, and, it's, and one guy said you should you should cut your losses, count your blessings, and go home happy that it was just one sheep you lost. The shepherd doesn't do that. In fact, no one would. Jesus says, "What man of you, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, wouldn't go in search of a lost one?" This is an extraordinary action. This is something that would be common to, to the people. And he's drawing on vast Old Testament uh, references to God as shepherd. God is the shepherd of the flock. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In Isaiah 40, verse 11, uh, Isaiah writes, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead them those that are with, uh, shoot, and I proofread these slides too, and I made a, there's a mistake there. He will gently lead those that are with young, not that that are with the young. Ezekiel 34, I want to read that passage to you. It's God's indictment against the kings and the priests who have been in, ineffectively ministering to his people. And, uh, it's sobering scripture for anyone in a position of leadership to read. But in verse 11 of Ezekiel 34, God says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among the sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. Notice God doesn't say, if I find them, if, he says, I will rescue them. Paul writes in Romans about how God foreknew those who would be saved. Every single one of them will be saved. There will be, and I've mentioned this before, there will be no empty seats at the feast in heaven. All whom God foreknows and had foreordained for salvation. And, and we can discuss that at, 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 a, at a later date. And, and Bill can teach us exactly what it means, uh, foreknowledge and predestination and all those other fancy terms. All of them are going to be rescued because God will find his sheep. And that should give us great comfort. And it says in verse 13 in Ezekiel 34, I will bring them out from the peoples, gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land with rich pasture, and they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them to lie down, declares the Lord. And verse 16 is really um, one of the key verses. I will seek the loss, and I will bring back the stray. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. And the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. God will find his sheep. He is the good shepherd, as, as Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse 11. So the man finds his sheep, his lost sheep, and Tia has miniature sheep in her, in her arms there that needs shearing. The man finds the sheep and says, rejoice with me. Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. Here's the first hint. Here's the first insight into God's joy at the return of the one that was lost. Um, in the same way, the father's joy over the returned sinner is shared by those in his presence, but not everybody, right? Not everybody is rejoicing. Uh, Simon the Pharisee didn't consider himself to be a debtor when Jesus gave that parable about the two people who owed differing sums of money. Simon saw himself outside that illustration. He wasn't. Jesus was pointing right at Simon as he's giving this parable. The Pharisees in the temple praying with the tax collector standing behind him thanked God that he was not like other sinners, meaning that he doesn't need repentance, or so he feels, so he thinks. He thinks himself righteous. 
And because of that, he doesn't need the repentance that God is offering. What woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses the coin, doesn't diligently seek until she finds it? Uh, many women were in the crowd. Many women were following Jesus. And so he's not excluding them from the kingdom at all. The silver coin is the, uh, it's strange. Luke uses the word drachma uh, rather than, than the term for denarius, which the denarius replaced the drachma, but it may be that Theophilus, who he is writing to, Luke chapter one, verse one, he's writing to this official, this, this man, that he might have certainty about the things that he's been taught. He may be more familiar with the drachma that it was a day's pay. It was the cost of a sheep, ironically, because we just had a parable about sheep. Uh, an oxen cost four drachma or four denarius. She goes to an awful lot of effort to find this coin. Uh, some have said, well, it might, maybe it was a coin from the headdress that would be a woman's dowry, but those headdresses had like 50 coins and were the property of a wealthy woman. Here's a woman who doesn't have a window in her home because she has to light a lamp to find the coin. Uh, there's no other light source coming in unless she's doing the searching at night. Uh, so she, this is a poor individual. Uh, we would search for a day's pay if we somehow we were paid in cash and brought home our pay in an envelope and then the envelope disappeared. We'd do some pretty serious hunting for it. When she finds it, there's this joy, there's this celebration that seems to be all out of proportion for the worth of the coin that was found. But this isn't a parable about economics, nor was the parable about the lost sheep a parable about counting you know, strategies and, and God sitting down and considering, is it really worth sending Jesus to the cross for the few that are going to respond? It's... Paul calls uh, the cross foolishness in um, one of the Corinthian letters, foolishness to those who are perishing, because it doesn't make sense. Uh, it, from a practical standpoint, it doesn't make sense. Why on earth would God expend so much effort for people such as me? I can't explain it. Um, somebody else can teach a class on it on the why of it. So we get to the parable of the Good Samaritan. I know I blew through the first two kind of quickly because I want to spend a little bit of time. I really I don't want to look at the sun, the 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 wastrel sun as as I call him, maybe not on this slide, but on another one. I want to look rather at the dialogue that the father is having with the elder son and then draw that back to verses one and two because I think there's a lot of parallels going on there that, that, we, that we see. This is a very familiar text. I can't, if we were to somehow know each of us, the number of lessons we've heard on the prodigal son and then add them all up, the number would easily be in the hundreds uh, because it's a favorite text to preachers. It's a favorite text to teachers. It's, I, I'm, we teach it to children in children's classes uh, saying that this, this makes a good story for kids. And it does make a good story for kids, but it's a story for adults. It's a story for those of us who find ourselves in need of repentance and perhaps in need of an attitude adjustment at the repentance of other people. Grace extended to me is wonderful. Grace extended to Gail? I don't know about that. <laughs> and Gail's giving the double thumbs up. Yes. I agree, Gail, you and I both need grace. In the previous two parables, though, Jesus has established the idea that celebration is appropriate, is an appropriate response to the recovery of what has been lost. No one stands off and grumbles over the foolishness of the search for the sheep or sulks at the celebration that the woman has. Um, when she finds her coin. This parable is going to present to us in a dramatic fashion, the contrasting responses over the repentance of the one sinner, uh, the, the, the lost sinner who is now found. Um, 
Christy writes, it's, it's a great story for kids because they're the most likely to turn into the older brother. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if you're dealing with the, it's not fair to the other sibling, I can understand that. Like the older brother, the Pharisees reckon themselves as uh, faithful servants who don't need repentance and they begrudge any grace, unmerited grace or that's shown on uh, the, the sinners here. The Pharisees are grumbling in verse two, the older son is grumbling uh, in uh, verse 29 and following. And there's some, there's some neat parallels that draw back and forth there, but the primary focus of the parable is on the father and his actions. The father isn't seeking for the son, but he's watching for it. And the other two parables, we have the, the man going in search of the lost sheep and the woman sweeping the house for the, for the coin. Here the father is watching. He's watching in anticipation of the return of the one who has strayed. And when he comes, he welcomes him back with a feast which parallels Jesus receiving the sinners and eating with them, over which, remarkably, the Pharisees have a lot of problems. Uh, the Pharisees are taking issue with his actions, like the older brother standing outside saying, tisk, 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 you shouldn't be doing this. Don't you know what sort of people you're eating with? Well, of course, Jesus knows what sort of people he's eating with. He knows what sort of people he's opened the doors of the kingdom of heaven to, people like you and me people who have sinned, people who need forgiveness, people who need grace, people who need to be about the business of repenting and bringing forth the fruit of repentance. The father here is the focal point of this parable. His actions, both in receiving back the, the younger son and in going out from the party, leaving the party and going out to the older son who's standing outside pouting and counseling with him and encouraging him to come in and join the celebration. And the older son is standing there like a, like a sulky child who doesn't want to because it's not fair. You bought him a new toy. I didn't get a new toy. All my toys are broken. You've never bought me a new toy. Um, it's, it's, it's unfair. Grace offends our sense of fairness. That's on a slide that's coming uh, in a few minutes here. So the son, after he has fallen on hard times, comes back rehearsing this speech. And it's interesting, the phrase that he uses. Um, in verse 18, I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. That only appears one other place in the entire Bible, and you find it on the lips of Pharaoh, speaking to Moses, who's saying, I have sinned before heaven and, and you uh, in not letting the people go. And I'll pray to God that he, that he takes this, this, this plague away from me, knowing that he's going to, to break his promise. Exodus chapter 10, verse 16, if you want the reference of where that is. So he rehearses the speech and he comes back to the father and only gets part of it out. Uh, as soon as he confesses his unworthiness to be called a son, the father takes over, won't hear the rest of it, has nothing, and you, you, just, you just hush up. And there's another mistake, takes over from there, not form there. I didn't proofread these slides as well as I thought I did. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24, before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. That's God speaking of repentant Israel. And before the words are even out of your mouth, God has already extended forgiveness. God has already said, welcome back. God has already restored us. No one had given the son anything in verse 16 when he was starving there and wanting to eat the pods that he was feeding the pigs, the carob, uh, the sweet carob pods that they would feed to the pigs. Now he's given everything by the one that he has wounded so badly. 
you know taking the inheritance, his share of the inheritance and leaving home breaks his father's heart. When we wander away from God and go after sin, you know it breaks his heart. But returning to him, joy and, and, and rejoicing ensue there. And God gives us everything. Remember what David says in Psalm 51, restore to me the joy of your salvation the joy of your salvation, the joy of being counted as one of your children, the joy of being accepted and welcomed in your presence. There's joy in our salvation. The father has no intention of letting the son work his way back into his favor. He's going to restore him. He's not going to make him probationary uh, son. He's not going to accept him as a, he's, the son is saying uh, in verse uh, 17, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? This isn't even the inner household servants. These are the people that are hired to work out in the fields, not the ones that are entrusted inside the house to take care of the, to take care of the matters in the home, serving the family directly. These are the ones, this is the outside, the outer circle of servants, if you will. Um, he, want, he wants, you know, it's the, the starting starting pay the guy who graduates from college with his with his new degree and says i want to get a job as a ceo and start at the top you don't start at the top you start at the bottom you start at the bottom of the company you work your way up well the father has no intention of letting his son do this he's immediately restoring him back to a position of sonhood um, he gives him a kiss he gives him a robe ring sandals all of which are symbolizing his acceptance and his receiving back of his son, making it clear that he regards him still as a son. When you go to God in prayer for the 420th time about a certain sin saying, Father, please forgive me, he doesn't say to you, okay, you know what? I'll take you back on a probationary basis. I'll take you back. You know, that's, that's, you know, I'm cutting your pay in half. I don't know what half of eternity is. Uh, Chad's a very smart individual. Maybe Chad can figure out what half of eternity is. Probably still eternity, right? <laughs> yeah. Chad says half of eternity is eternity, so I'll take half pay. Thank you. The older son, though, is the, is the interesting character here. He belongs to a category, the category of people who think they don't need repentance, um, and therefore they don't repent. He appeals to his faithful service to compare himself favorably to his younger brother. Luke chapter 18, verse 10 says, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, comparing himself favorably to someone else. Meanwhile, in verse 13, the tax collector standing far off wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, he's the one who goes home justified. God, be merciful to me, a sinner because he shows that repentant attitude. In doing his duty, the older son clearly thinks that he should receive a special reward from his father. Luke 17, verse uh, seven, will any of you as a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table. Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Can I really go to God with my resume and impress him and say, look at all the wonderful things I've done for you, God. I deserve a really special place. Jesus says in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
but only those who do have the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these wonderful things in your name? And he says, away from me, I never knew you. And Chad says, no, I can't, I can't bring forward my resume because there are no scar nail scars in my wrists. And that's true. I don't measure up, no matter how highly I might think of myself. In fact, the higher I think of myself, probably the further away from grace I'm getting. Um, and the older son's desire to eat with his friends sort of mirrors the Pharisees' behavior when they gather in their little groups and exclude all who don't measure up to their standards of purity. And you know the older brother wants to do that. I'll have a party, but I'm not going to invite my, my younger brother because he's a, he is a, a, a reformed reprobate. This is um, Matthew 20, verses 1 to 11, only on a more escalated version. The complaint of the older son here. In Matthew chapter 20, we have the parable of the workers in the vineyard. The vineyard owner, the master of the house, goes out early in the morning and hires people and sends them into his vineyard saying, I'll pay you a denarius at the end of the day. He goes out several times through the remainder of the day until it's down to the last hour. And he finds some people still standing there and he sends them into the vineyard and says to them, um, you go into the vineyard too. This is Matthew 20, verse seven. You go into the vineyard too, not even, not even discussing wages. You go into the vineyard too. And then when evening comes, calls all the laborers together and says to the foreman who's paying the men, pay the men their wages, starting with the one who was hired last, going down to him who was hired first. Well, when the guy who worked an hour comes up, he receives a denarius, a full day's pay. And so we're told in verse 10, now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius, and on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house. They're complaining because grace offends our sense of fairness. Because we're on the inside, right? We're, we've received grace. Grace is wonderful if I'm receiving it. But hasn't that brother gone forward? five or six other times in the past confessing the same sin? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we spend some time talking to him and, and, uh, and questioning the, the veracity of, or the sincerity of the repentance he's showing here? One, one writer writes the, this uh, bit here that I have, um, Christianity and Judaism have clear provisions for the restoration of the penitent returnee. But where does it say that such provisions include a banquet and dancing? Yes, let the prodigal return, but to bread and water, not a fattened calf. In sackcloth, not a new robe. Wearing ashes, not a new ring. In tears, not in merriment. Kneeling, not dancing. Has the party canceled the seriousness of sin and repentance? And I, I, the answer to that, obviously, is no. But Jesus is telling this parable in answer to the Pharisees who are complaining because Jesus is receiving the tax collectors and the sinners and saying, he's going to make the point in, in Luke 19 when he sits down with Zacchaeus and the Pharisees are standing outside complaining that he's eating with a tax collector and Jesus is going to say, this man too is the son of Abraham. He's your brother. Rejoice because salvation has come to this house today. He doesn't say rejoice, but he does say salvation has come to this house today. The implication is the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, Pharisees should rejoice that the tax collectors and the sinners are coming to repentance. But instead, they're saying, no, 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 not at my table, you aren't. This is a, this is a table for pure people. Well, let me tell you, if heaven's only for pure people, we might as well end class right now. We're only pure because Jesus makes us that way, because we're covered with the blood of Jesus. Is it possible that we do not fathom God's intense love for us and the joy that he has, the, his degree of joy over our own repentance? 
do we have the attitude of the older brother and say, well, you know, so-and-so isn't deserving. None of us are deserving. We're all sinners saved by the grace of Jesus. The ground is level with the cross. None of us are more righteous than or worse sinners than anyone else. We're all equally guilty under sin, wages of sin being death. Uh, none of us are deader than others. Neither are, are any of us more saved than others. Uh, it's, I'll, I'll have eternity in heaven uh, with God. Gail isn't going to have eternity plus three weeks for good behavior. That's Eternity is eternity. Next week, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 16. Um, I'm going to stop the share and stop the recording and invite you guys to